afternoon uh, to everybody who's dialing in to join us today and very warm welcome uh, to everybody. Um, this is the latest in Aperio Intelligence's series of webinars. Um, today's topic is fraud uh, in the age of pandemic challenges uh, for business. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, immediately familiar with uh, Perio Intelligence. We are a London-based global risk consulting business offering uh, services across enhanced due diligence, investigations, strategic intelligence, and ESG advisory. Um, my name is Paul Doran. I'm the director of investigations uh, with the company. Uh, my role and the, the role of my team is to work with our clients um, to deal with sensitive and complex um, internal investigations um, within companies, which could range from uh, fraud, embezzlement, corruption, bribery, uh, and uh, serious employee malfeasance. And also working with um, law firms and uh, advisors on litigation support um, and uh, support for companies seeking restitution and redress uh, in legal disputes. Joining us uh, today, we have three uh, extremely um, prominent uh, voices in, in the field um, who will be sharing their insights and uh, analysis on uh, fraud and corruption trends uh, in the pandemic era, particularly um, looking back over the last year, uh, what those trends might have been. And as we gradually emerge, hopefully from uh, the worst of the pandemic into a post-pandemic scenario, uh, what the likely um, trends will be as we move forward into 2021. The speakers uh, come from diverse uh, backgrounds, um, from law enforcement, from the private sector, and from the consulting uh, arena. Um, we have Detective Chief Superintendent Alex Rothwell, uh, who is the Head of Fraud Operations from the City of London Police and previously the Deputy National Coordinator for Economic and Financial Crime. We also have Ivan Dimitrov, who is the Global Compliance Officer for Cargo Tech, which is a Finnish-based global con uh, cargo uh, consulting and handling company. Uh, Ivan uh, is a very experienced um, compliance specialist, uh, previously spent five years with uh, Telenor Bulgaria, um, a telecoms operator as compliance officer, and more recently as a uh, compliance officer with Grameen Phone, which is the largest uh, telecoms provider in Bangladesh. And joining us from uh, Singapore, we have uh, Maya Budmanis, who is an Australian lawyer by background, um, a very seasoned and experienced compliance specialist uh, who's worked for many years in the pharmaceuticals, medical devices and life sciences sector, and is now the principal and founder of a consulting uh, company in this area called uh, Future Fit. Um, together, uh, our speakers today will give you a, a, a global view of fraud trends in the pandemic uh, and uh, the emerging challenges that businesses will face uh, in the year to come uh, as we emerge from uh, the current situation. Um, I'm sure that you'll find their, uh, their presentations interesting and stimulating. Um, each of you as uh, dial-in uh, attendees will have an opportunity to put questions to the, uh, to the panelists. You will have a, a, a function that you should be able to use on screen, which will uh, allow us to see your questions. And then there will be a Q and A session uh, on completion of the, of the presentations. But please do keep these uh, questions coming in. And what I will do is pick out the, um, the ones which I think are going to be the most interesting and thought provoking uh, for, for our panelists and for the attendees. Uh, and hopefully that should stimulate uh, quite a good discussion uh, in the time that's uh, available to us today. Um, one uh, point of note is that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, 
uh, because some of our attendees obviously would like to to have a, a record of this also for people who uh, might not have been able to attend today. Um, there's nothing which is going to be in this presentation which should be uh, sensitive in any way. This is um, open and transparent uh, debate um, and uh, information. Um, nothing here which should provide any, um, any sort of uh, worries along those lines. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the fir first speaker today, who is uh, Detective Chief or Inspector uh, Alex Rothwell of the City of London Police. Um, over to you, Alex. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to uh, to speak. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so um, just over a year ago, uh, I was at a RUSI uh, event, which is the Royal United Services Institute. Uh, I was there in person uh, and we were engaged in a discussion uh, about whether we were experiencing a fraud a pandemic. Uh, and of course, the word pandemic is only just starting to feature in the public's consciousness. And of course, we really had no idea then of the horrors that were to follow. But um, I don't think it was an inaccurate analogy, uh, a disease that affects a large number of people that has spread across the world. Um, and what reminded me of that conversation we had a year ago in February uh, was an article in the Daily Telegraph uh, last weekend, which described online fraud now uh, as an epidemic uh, within a pandemic. Uh, and there is no doubt that criminals have been able to capitalize on this uh, really unique set of circumstances that COVID has created. Um, but I don't think any of us see this as a short term uh, issue. Uh, the digitalization of society has created perfect conditions for criminals to operate in. Uh, and as with any health pandemic, you need a strong and effective coordinated response. Um, so that UK response, quite rightly, I think, needs to be led by our government uh, here in the UK. Uh, but just as we've seen virus spread across international boundaries, um, global coordination is also required to tackle the fraud threat. And the law enforcement response is a really vital uh, part of that. So I, I thought I'd just use this session to describe how the UK is approaching the problem, uh, the role that my organisation and policing has to play and just highlight some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, so firstly, uh, we talk in government about economic crime, uh, which is a broad definition. Uh, it's not just fraud, it's money laundering, bribery and corruption, market abuse, sanctions evasion, uh, you know, even the illicit financing of terrorism. Uh, th these are issues I suspect that most of you on this call will be dealing with routinely. Um, for many years, uh, it's seemingly been a low priority for governments. Uh, we've pursued a prosperity agenda here in the UK. We've made it easy to form companies, great tax breaks for overseas investment, more open banking, et cetera, et cetera. But in recent years, uh, I think there's been a recognition that the economic advantages of that agenda have also created, uh, I think, what can legitimately be considered a national security risk. Um, and that risk is affecting our reputation. And whilst they're historic, uh, the Panama Papers, the Russian laundromat, Binten files, uh, you know, they're all testament uh, to the scale of the threat. Um, but I think another point to note is that while we express concern at how other jurisdictions enable crime against the UK uh, and its citizens, um, many other countries view the UK as a jurisdiction of risk. Uh, I was at an Interpol uh, conference recently and the head of fraud for Timor Leste uh, explained to me in some detail how its citizens were falling in to scams uh, involving UK bank accounts. So um, my professional focus is on fraud um, I, and it's the offending which we would uh, refer to as volume fraud in policing, which I think really undergone a metamorphosis uh, from an offence that was largely considered to be a, a corporate issue years ago the one that actually affects millions of citizens and businesses now. Uh, you've only got to look at something like uh, cloned investment websites uh, to see how citizens can lose money, but corporations lose customers all from the same criminal act. And the cumulative effect this is having on our society and prosperity is starting to bite. So the government in the UK's overall response hinges on the economic crime plan. Uh, there's 52 points in the plan. If you're really keen, uh, Rusi have an economic crime plan tracker on their website. But fundamentally, what it's creating is opportunities for enforcement, regulatory reform, uh, prevention, 
uh, and education. Uh, and that includes SARS reform uh, and companies house uh, reform, for example. So the Security Minister, James Brokenshire, is responsible for all of this activity, working to an economic crime board jointly chaired by the Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, underneath this governance, the National Economic Crime Centre was created, which is a partnership between the UK's law enforcement agencies and is intended to be the national voice on economic crime. So the NEC, as we refer to it, it's hosted by the National Crime Agency. Uh, I have staff embedded in the, in the neck as well. Um, its responsibility, uh, uh, this is the National Crime Agency, is to lead the UK's response to serious and organised crime. And that very much includes illicit finance. But I think increasingly there's recognition that the volume fraud threat in particular is serious and organised crime. Uh, and organised criminal networks are behind a lot of this offending. Um, but they're not just traditional villains. These are complex inter-country criminal relationships. So I do think you'll see the NCA play a stronger role in managing economic crime in future. My organization's role in all of this is to provide leadership and coordination of the policing response to fraud uh, in England and Wales. And this responsibility was born out of a government-sponsored review of fraud back in 2006. Uh, which identified that we effectively had a borderless crime being dealt with by a policing system that was entirely based on geographic areas of responsibility. So um, in addition to this leadership role, there's three key services that we provide. Um, the first is a national investigative capability. Uh, so we take on nationally significant investigations, regardless of their geographic nexus. We work very closely with fraud investigators around the country. Um, and aligned to this, I have dedicated units focused on intellectual property crime, insurance fraud, uh, and fraud linked to the financial services uh, sector, uh, particularly issues like the insider threat. And, and these units are entirely funded by industry umbrella organisations. The second is an economic crime academy, which uh, provides fraud and economic crime training for all UK policing. Uh, we do do some capacity building in overseas jurisdictions, uh, and we do additional training for wider public and private sector bodies. And we have a very strong relationship with the public sector counter fraud profession, uh, who have a lot of work to do now uh, on the back of the government COVID relief measures. Um, and then finally, the third function is action fraud and the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau. So just in case you're not familiar with the system, action fraud is a national reporting center. Uh, it's based in Scotland. NFIB takes the data from action fraud plus Banking Sector Trade Association UK finance uh, data and data from CIFAS, which is a fraud prevention service for subscribers. And the information that we get enables us to provide packages for policing to investigate based on whether there is a viable line of inquiry. But of course, the added benefit of having access to this reporting data is that you've got visibility of offending patterns. And that information is increasingly uh, allowing us to develop a much better understanding of the threat picture and generate more proactive opportunities for law enforcement intervention. So just in terms of what that threat picture looks like for policing, um, the, the Office for National Statistics um, uh, shows fraud to be in the region of 3.8 million offences uh, a year. Now, that doesn't include businesses. Um, that makes it the most prevalent crime in the UK, and it makes up well over a third of all crime, um, but it's definitely underreported to policing. Uh, last year, we had over a million information reports into the centre that translated into just over 300,000 certified incidents of crime, but we know the real figures higher. We've seen a 41% increase in reporting of action fraud since 2014. Uh, and by 2025, we expect uh, the ONS uh, stats to be in the region of 5 million frauds a year uh, if the rate of increase continues. Uh, Home Office uh, estimate the cost of the UK is something like £6.8 billion a year. Uh, but um, Portsmouth University uh, do some stats which take into account loss of opportunity. And they estimate the real figure is more like £190 billion uh, a year. Uh, and just to put it in context, the UK defence budget is something like £40 billion pounds, uh, a year. Um, but we also talk about, um, you know, we talk about value, uh, volume uh, a lot, but the sum of money involved 
is only really relevant to each case. Uh, and it could be argued that our focus should be on victim impact, which could be devastating, uh, whether it's an individual or a business. And last year, Action Fraud requested immediate police deployments for 225 callers uh, who were felt to be suicidal and in immediate uh, danger. Um, so finally, um, I, I've just covered this issue. Has the pandemic created an opportunity for fraudsters? Well, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, overall, are we seeing any more fraud than we would have expected to see in a normal year? Well, actually the answer to that is no, um, but we have seen a shift in behavior. Uh, we've seen a big increase in online shopping reporting. Uh, bogus websites uh, feature very prominently in reporting. Um, we take down thousands of websites every year, but there's always more and many are cloning legitimate businesses. Um, phishing uh, and smishing campaigns feature very strongly in uh, reporting and uh, COVID is routinely used as a, as a hook. Um, but just a reminder, you can send both emails and SMS messages to the National Cyber Security Center, and we work together to tackle the, uh, the problem. It is definitely worth sending reports to the National Cyber Security Center or emails or SMS messages that you receive. Romance fraud uh, has increased significantly, 16% rise over the course of the year. Again, it's not surprising. We've got people separated from their usual support networks. But interestingly, a lot of the offending we see isn't linked to dating. A lot of people are striking up friendships with people over shared hobbies like uh, word games. Uh, investment scams, uh, particularly cryptocurrency, uh, seeing high levels of reporting. Um, but over the year, we did see a significant decrease in uh, computer service software fraud, um, which largely uh, emanates from uh, illicit uh, Indian call centers. So I, I think lockdown had a lot to do with that decrease. Um, we also saw a decrease in payment diversion fraud uh, or mandate fraud. And I think that's a big one for, for businesses to be aware of. Um, but interestingly, what we're now seeing uh, is numbers very much on the, uh, on the rise again. Um, and a lot of that mandate offending originates from email compromise. So it's really important to be careful with the links that you or your staff are clicking on, particularly working from home. Uh, uh, nearly all cyber attacks rely on social engineering. Um, we have had some operational successes. One of our units uh, has arrested over 40 individuals linked to smishion campaigns, uh, for example. Uh, but Paul, I think I've more than used up my uh, time. So um, I, I'm here for some uh, Q&A as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll pause there if that's okay. Alex, thank you for that um, very, very interesting uh, overview. Some uh, really important food for thought um, and some very startling statistics. Um, uh, UK statistics, so um, I think we have to probably extrapolate those into an international context, but £6.8 billion pounds worth of fraud in the UK alone. Um, and I'm very struck also by your um, analogy of fraud being an epidemic within a pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be lots of uh, questions from uh, participants today when we come to the Q&A, but I would um, sort of set the scene perhaps for, for one of those questions when, when we get to the Q&A and, and ask you to, to sort of think a little bit um, about this tension that you've um, identified between, um, let's say, the UK's um, post-Brexit um, focus on inward investment and, and, and greater international engagement uh, across the world with new trading relationships, etc., plus a, a, a recognition um, that to a certain extent, the, the UK has been a permissive uh, location for um, organised and white collar crime and, and where the balance actually lies in national priorities between, um, between those, two, those, those two issues. Um, and I'm sure there'll be um, lots of interest around that topic. Um, right now, I'll change uh, gears a little bit and um, invite uh, our next uh, participant, our next speaker, um, Ivan uh, Dimitrov, who is uh, joining us today from um, Sofia in Bulgaria, um, will be speaking uh, from the perspective of the compliance officer within a multinational organization. And I'm sure that Ivan will have um, some very interesting points to make about his personal experience of uh, running a compliance program uh, during the pandemic uh, times. Um, so over to you, Ivan. 
Thank you, Paul, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me in this webinar. Uh, today, I have the opportunity and uh, privilege, actually, to talk to you and to discuss with you the challenges in managing a compliance program in these times of pandemic. Uh, I want to share a practical perspective uh, on the actual effects of COVID-19 on our work and what was the actual impact on us as compliance pro uh, professionals. Uh, one of the very evident effects of the uh, compliance uh, of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, us as uh, compliance professionals is uh, maybe the way we perceive risk. So, as you can see from this slide, uh, as per a recent survey conducted among uh, uh, UK compliance professionals, approximately 56% of uh, the compliance community believes that COVID-19 uh, will result in permanent increase in compliance risk. However, in order to really reveal what is uh, triggering this anxiety in the compliance community, I believe that we need to actually carefully examine uh, what is the practical impact of the pandemic on the different elements of the compliance program. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through all of the elements of the compliance program, so I have chosen three elements uh, that we are going to reveal in details. The first one is culture, after that third party risk, and finally investigations. So let's start with culture. Uh, preserving compliance culture in these unprecedented times, is it possible? Actually, I believe it is. Uh, so there were a lot of disruptions to the compliance culture that were caused by the pandemic. I uh, remember like one year ago when the whole pandemic started, there was a lot of panic uh, throughout the world. And this panic later transformed itself into a particular level of uncertainty. Uncertainty as to uh, whether there will be new lockdowns, whether there will be um, new measures that will prevent the businesses from operating freely. In addition, there is still a huge pressure on the salespeople to actually sell. I believe that this uh, push to sell in combination with the decreased supervision because of the remote working environment can be potentially a recipe for disaster. So how can we prevent this disaster? Uh, there are very powerful tools in place, and I'm sure that most of you know at least some of them. The first one being the tone from the top. And here I can give you a very practical example from my organization, from my company. Uh, last year when the pandemic uh, started, uh, we had uh, a town hall, immediate town hall, uh, where our CEO, of course, emphasized on the importance of uh, the employees being safe and healthy. Uh, but the next thing that he mentioned is that now it's not the time for cutting corners meaning that now it's the time actually to follow our compliance processes and not to figure out a way to circumvent them. And this was a very powerful message that resonated throughout the organization. And uh, needless to say, it helped us a lot as compliance professionals in the organization. Uh, so if you have not yet taken the chance to use your top executives to cascade this message to the organization, please do this. The next thing that uh, you can do is use e-learnings. Uh, if you're anything like me, you would probably prefer face-to-face -face trainings, in-person uh, awareness sessions, but unfortunately, we don't have the luxury to do this. For this reason, the e-learnings should become our new best friend. And I'm not talking only about the annual code of conduct e-learning. I'm talking about actually developing new e-learnings. They might be simplified, they might be shorter in time, uh, but they should be also targeting uh, particular parts of your organization and particular topics, depending on the risk assessment that you have uncovered, uh, that you have conducted. Uh, another point which is very important is naturally communications, uh, especially now that we are working from our homes and uh, we are not in the office. I think that uh, uh, 
communication is the key to actually uh, boost the morale and the compliance culture in the organization. So it's never too much at this, at this time of, uh, of our life, definitely. Moving to the third party risk, I strongly believe that now the importance of the due diligence is even higher than before. Uh, why is that? Because, you know, we have been facing because of the pandemic, a lot of supply chain disruptions, meaning that some of our vendors and our business partners were not able to deliver what was promised to our companies, which put uh, our company in very difficult position. Uh, we needed and we still need to onboard new business partners very quickly. And in order to do this, of course, we need to check those business partners, those vendors. Uh, and this is putting a lot of pressure on us as compliance professionals to do the relevant due diligence very fast. But there are a lot of challenges in doing a due diligence in time of pandemic. For example, there are a lot of jurisdictions that unfortunately do not have uh, electronic records, uh, company records. So for this reason, you need to get them, uh, you need to get these records from physical locations, which might be closed because of lockdowns. What can we do in order to address the risks and the challenges for the third party risk when it comes to uh, the pandemics? Well, my first advice for you would be to really monitor the risk trends and focus on them. Uh, naturally, the, we as compliance professionals are more focused on the integrity risks that we uncover. But uh, in these unprecedented times, I would actually argue that we need to be focused also on the potential financial red flags that more, might pop up. A lot of companies have been challenged by the pandemic and uh, uh, naturally you don't want to onboard a business partner that will become insolvent, insolvent or will, uh, will be bankrupted in a couple of uh, weeks or months. So for this reason, when you're doing the due diligence, look for indications for um, lack of financial stability, like uh, for example, sharp decrease in the number of employees or sharp decrease in the revenue of the company. These are indications that you need to take into uh, consideration. Another advice that I can give you is to be understanding, be practical and be smart. The example that I gave you earlier, there are jurisdictions where you don't have electronic records, company records, you need to onboard the business partner. You can, because of a lockdown, the business partner cannot provide you with more recent uh, documentation uh, for its company registration. What do you do in this situation? Well, maybe you can consider actually onboarding this partner at this point with uh, the documents that are not maybe uh, the, more the most recent one that you want to get. Onboard this partner, but follow up, follow up. Be sure that after the lockdown is lifted, you follow up and you get the most recent documents, you review them. Uh, and this is the way to operate, unfortunately, in, in, time of, in times of pandemics. You need to be very practical and to protect also the company that you work for. Uh, you should also do the audits and inspections uh, of your business partners in a more creative way. You have to do them predominantly online because of the travel restrictions. So use technology, ask your business partner to switch on uh, uh, their phone cameras, walk you around the office, figure out whether they're even following the COVID-19 uh, measures. Uh, uh, so this is what you can uh, actually do in order to do a good audit at these times. <laughs> Last but not least, moving to the investigations. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are in the business of actually conducting investigations. So what are the challenges to, to doing an investigation in these times? Of course, the travel restrictions. It's very obvious. We cannot travel these days as much as we want to, to do it, uh, which leads to a couple of other problems. For example, um, the interviews, how do we conduct them? How do we collect documentation? Uh, these are challenges that we need to address somehow. And my advice, uh, humble advice for you, is first to actually assess and amend your investigation procedures and protocols. They might not be well adopted, uh, well adapted to um, a remote type of investigation. So have a look at them and adjust them accordingly. Another thing that uh, you should do is onboard support. There is no shame in asking for help. 
uh, try to uh, onboard support in the in the sense that, for example, there might be cases that usually would be you, on your desk, but since you're not able to travel and to handle them, you might want to outsource them to a function that uh, can support you, that has its representatives on the ground, such as HR, for example. Uh, another option to, for getting more support is actually to get an external investigation provider. A good example, of course, is uh, a period you can always use them uh, and uh, of course you can use uh, a video and uh, other investigative uh, uh, suppliers also in cases where you need uh, where you're not only um, um, uh, where you're not only in the problem of uh, traveling but you also want a more independent view on a particular issue that is being investigated uh, and uh, of course take advantage of technology uh, I'm sure that many of you who have done interviews uh, know how hard it is to read a person. And imagine doing this by a phone, it's close to impossible. So for this reason, uh, do the interviews with the uh, interviewed people with their cameras switched on and ask them in advance and prepare them, tell them that their cameras should be switched on in order to avoid any complaints from their side that they were not aware that the interview will be done with cameras switched on. And uh, my last advice for you would be to be mindful of the local regulations. Now that we are doing investigations from various corners of the world in different jurisdictions, there might be a lot of question marks around uh, the uh, applicable law and uh, the court that will be competent to handle a potential uh, issue, a potential court case. So this is something that you should be mindful of and you should consult your legal counselors uh, for additional support in doing this. So with this, I'm wrapping up my presentation and uh, maybe Paul, you can take the lead now. Ivan, thank you for that excellent overview. Um, I'm sure that there was plenty of uh, extremely useful information in there for uh, people occupying similar roles to, to yours. I'm struck particularly by a couple of uh, the points that you made, and no doubt we'll come back to these points in the Q&A session. But I think the, the tone from the top is, is, is really a sort of fundamental um, uh, component of an effective compliance culture and a, uh, an effective compliance program. Um, but especially during the pandemic uh, times when there is pressure on supply chains, pressure on the business generally, um, a, a very severe economic downturn, companies fighting for survival. So it takes, I think, brave leadership from, um, from corporate executives to still emphasize and still uh, place first and foremost a commitment to ethics and integrity uh, in the way business is conducted. Um, I'm also struck uh, particularly by your um, advocacy of, of creative ways of using the technology to overcome the challenges which uh, compliance officers, investigators and auditors are, are faced with uh, at the moment. And indeed, our own experience over the last um, year or so has been that the technology has served us relatively well, um, probably better than we anticipated in some ways. Um, but perhaps there's also a feeling that there is no real substitute for uh, professionals such as yourself in those roles to actually deploy on the ground, actually see um, and visit physical uh, locations. And I think perhaps one thing to consider as we move uh, into the final part of our webinar today um, is, is whether the technology uh, will become less prominent as we come out of the pandemic or will the cost savings uh, implicit in that mean that there will be commercial pressure to keep up or keep on using technology as a substitute for uh, for travel related to investigations or audit. It's it, it's an important question, uh, I think. Um, but for now, we'll move to our um, third and final uh, panelist, um, Maya Butmanis. Um, as mentioned in the uh, introduction, Maya is an Australian lawyer um, and has a very long and distinguished track record in um, senior compliance positions within uh, principally the, the pharmaceuticals, medical devices and, and life sciences industry, but is generally an expert um, in terms of um, anti-corruption and bribery 
uh, for businesses uh, generally. And that's, I think, the focus of her new endeavor with Future Fit. Um, I must declare a, an interest. Meyer and I worked extremely closely together several years ago on a very extensive uh, multi-jurisdictional FCPA investigation. And I can vouch for her uh, expertise and knowledge of this area. So I'm, I'm looking forward uh, particularly to this presentation. So Maya, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, good evening, good afternoon and good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm speaking to you from Singapore. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm an Australian lawyer. I've been working in the international markets for most of my career, particularly in life sciences, particularly uh, in legal and compliance roles. So, the, you know, the theme of today, which I think Aperio has, has really hit on is, you know, what are the fraud trends that we're seeing? And there's no doubt that legal and compliance um, has never been so busy. So from an, an internal perspective, as Ivan noted, you know, the, this black swan event of COVID created enormous global uncertainty, instability, you know, a feeling of protectionism around the world and acute financial pain. Um, and, you know, initially legal and compliance functions went to ground with questions about uh, disruption to supply chains, how you execute and validate purchase orders and legal contracts, um, how you suddenly pivot away from direct interactions with doctors and healthcare professionals and others, and you pivot to remote interactions. Um, and also uh, suddenly the rise of, um, you know, cyber threats. I'd like to bring to your attention a, a terrific report that I stumbled across um, uh, prepared by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And it was uh, an analysis that they did, did on a reasonably small scale, once you've heard Alex's astonishing, you know, figures from, from the UK alone. Um, but this analysis looked at, you know, 125 countries and 2,500 cases across public and private sector um, you know, entities, and not surprisingly, found that the three greatest areas of fraud and abuse lay in corruption, bribery, financial misstatement, and asset misappropriation. Now, either of those events, not, all of those events would have occurred either internally or were orchestrated uh, or collu in collusion with third parties. What is interesting here is that of that subset, of you know 2500 cases 10 percent of them had a, a recorded a medium loss of close to a million us dollars or 954,000, and the 84 percent or 86 percent of the cases recorded a loss of a hundred thousand before the issue was picked up so you know we all know that um grand theft is is big business uh and and this environment has probably created a perfect storm in some respects this is a great little slide from the perspective of um, an internal legal compliance audit investigator, um, because when one is considering internal controls and also policies to be put in place, and we know from our own experience and, and the findings that corruption, asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud are the three big ones, well, our internal policies should actually be focused around particularly these areas. We, we, we've got experience uh, in, in these trends. We've been told by external examiners. So um, many companies have high level codes of conduct, which are terrific, but they're very high level. What companies need to drill down on are specific policies and internal controls which address, you know, these weak points that lead to the three pillars of, um, you know, misconduct. So, obviously, you should have conflicts of interest policies, anti-bribery policies, policies around illegal gratuities, you know, or even economic extortion, depending on what sector you're in. Very strict policies should um, be centred, particularly uh, as they relate to third party engagement around um, asset misappropriation. So a lot of fraud occurs through 
cash and product leakage um, or, or even, uh, you know, counterfeit product being introduced into the market. And then, of course, you should have very strong policies around financial misstatement, which I, I won't go on about, but I can tell you that the Securities Exchange Commission in the US has, has never had a, a, a greater um, success in pursuing uh, large companies for financial misstatement fraud. So I saw one of the questions actually that was asked in the chat Cat, um, it addressed on internal controls. So typically within, um, you know, a large organisation, um, there are a subset of mechanisms by which one would detect, detect fraud. Now, one could argue in COVID that this has been far more challenging, but typically you will get findings from internal audits um, legal and compliance if they're conducting reviews, although there are, you know, dare I say, the first six months of 2020, most legal compliance personnel were pivoting to address other interactions and policy needs, um, uh, not necessarily looking for fraud, but trying to give advice on how to handle situations. Hotlines are very important if they are communicated widely and extensively, and if there's a trust factor in the organisation. What's really important, and, and in my experience, probably uh, less utilised, but very effective, management reviews. Um, a senior manager sitting down with a country manager and asking them to explain the business and the numbers uh, in exquisite terms. That can reveal a lot of information. Surveillance and monitoring is also useful, but again, an observation I make uh, from my own personal experience is, you know, in the international markets, uh, compliance and legal resourcing is so finite that th there's little opportunity for surveillance and monitoring unless, you know, some issue has occurred like an investigation or an audit. By accident, we can detect um, misconduct. And of course, really, you know, finance and audit should be certainly um, wide awake at the wheel when trying to escalate um, discrepancies. And, and sometimes you find in organisations, if there's not a strong culture of compliance, you know, finance uh, and IT will just let things slip. But these are opportunities to pounce on issues and address them. How is fraud concealed? Well, in I mean, Alex is the expert here. There, there are innumerable ways. As as humans are intelligent uh, creatures, uh, there are, they have, you know, great avenues for for creative um, collusion. So sham contracts uh, uh, can be widely used in the COVID situation. Some of the issues uh, related to whether purchase orders and legal agreements in, in um, you know, kind of time constrained fashions were actually legitimate? Were they um, validated by the procurement committee or the hospital or the, the buyer? Um, were they signed by, um, you know, an authorised individual? Conspiracy between parties is a huge, um, uh, uh, you know, avenue for um, kind of collusion. Of course, sidestepping um, IT controls is another way that fraud is concealed, but I would suggest that in the last, you know, 12 months, the IT function is also, in most organisations, has really had to step up and uh, counter all kinds of threat and monitoring employee monitoring, third party monitoring. So I think that um, investment into IT resources has certainly gone through the roof. A great avenue for um, concealing fraud, certainly in life sciences, is the misuse of grants and donations. So whilst, you know, travel and entertainment expenses went off, you know, fell off the cliff because no one's traveling, no one's being entertained, hopefully. Um, uh, there were certainly lots of peculiar and unorthodox unorth requests for money coming to companies for so-called grants, donations, uh, and, and, you know, this is where compliance and legal should really be stepping up and looking critically at these types of requests and following their, their judgment. 
Um, and of course, misclassification of expenditure is another way to conceal fraud. I'm kind of leaping through these slides because I know that I've um, you know, got some time constraints. Um, just in terms of the enforcement environment, uh, I was you know, fascinated to hear uh, Alex's statistics from the UK. You know, and, and despite whatever one thinks of President Trump, um, you know, last year, the Department of Justice and SEC, which are kind of independent agencies to some extent, they had a record breaking year in terms of imposing, imposing global penalties. So, you know, global penalties of circa 7.8 billion were imposed um, on, on companies. Many of those cases actually related to long-standing actions that had been in, in their pipeline for some years. Uh, the biggest uh, penalties imposed last year by um, the, the US agencies were on Airbus and Goldman Sachs. Other large penalties were imposed on companies like Walmart, you know, Telia, Novartis, and they related to, you know, long-standing investigations, which do have a limitation period. So they had to be kind of closed off within the six year or seven year period. Um, so what has the Biden administration done? Well, it certainly has beefed up its foreign bribery enforcement unit. It's appointed, um, personnel with extensive compliance and corporate monitorship experience. Now, I think this is very interesting for in-house counsel and, and lawyers. Um, so, you know, the DOJ had Hugh Chen from Pfizer for about two years. They decided that it was um, inadequate to rely upon uh, expertise, in-house compliance expertise from one person. So they have you know, they've uh, now gone on this recruitment drive and they've got expertise across industries, big tech, big pharma, you know, big fintech. Um, but they're beefing up of corporate monitor monitorship experience obviously means that these agencies intend to, you know, uh, impose more monitorship agreements on corporations in the event of, you know, NDAs or DPA settlements. And that's something that companies need to take account of. Um, and a big feature of uh, the future prosecution of companies will, will be on um, the adequacy of an organization's compliance program. It's, you know, basics and, and, and whether the corporation is making good faith efforts. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the agencies, and you could say that um, on both sides of the political aisle, um, there is a view that a strong enforcement uh, environment incentivizes incentivize, um, companies to comply with the law, but it also creates fair marketplaces. Uh, and, and that is why you see both um, in, in the US and in the UK, their enforcement systems have emerged very much in direct result to um, misconduct perceived in the marketplace, both through corporate abuses and grand theft. Just very quickly, um, I wanted to talk about the DOJ guidance that they, um, they, 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 they revised last year in you know, June. Maya, Maya, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, Maya. I think probably if we're going to um, have enough time for Q&A, we'll probably need to just uh, pause there. Um, okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I know the presentation will be shared later with um, the participants. We do only have 10 minutes of the hour left, and it's important for us now to move to uh, an opportunity for our um, for our participants to to have a uh, an opportunity to talk uh, or, or raise some of their questions. And we have had some interesting questions that have been uh, sent in to us during these uh, excellent presentations. Um, no worries at all, Maya. Um, I would just uh, sort of begin by um, reflecting one question, which I think probably um, would be best suited for Ivan. And Ivan, again, with respect to the time constraints, if it would be great if you could keep your answer relatively short, but what trends or changes uh, to the overall investigation process 
have you observed over the last year with remote or virtual investigations? And what kind of general trends do you think uh, are, are, are sort of emerging as far as internal corporate investigations um, uh, are, are concerned with, you know, the technology and the inability to travel? Yeah, sure. That's a brilliant question, actually. Uh, what I can think is that actually there is one common trend related to investigations. Uh, and this is the fact that uh, for the last year, the trend is that they are being prolonged or delayed, unfortunately. And this is due to the reasons that I have shared, travel restrictions, initial uncertainty and panic. Uh, what uh, I can say in terms of uh, statistics is that uh, there was um, a 13% 13 13 increase in case closure time, which is a lot. And uh, keep in mind that addressing uh, employee concerns in a timely way is actually of utmost uh, importance for the uh, compliance program uh, credibility. Uh, so for this reason, try to follow my advice and onboard support either internally or externally uh, so that you can mitigate some of the uh, hurdles and the disruptions for the investigative processes. Thank you, Van, for that very succinct answer. Um, perhaps this is one for Alex. Um, do you have any specific advice for firms which are experiencing uh, what you might call corporate identity theft, um, their names and addresses being used as part of scams. Um, and I guess this may be perhaps related to the fact that a lot of commercial properties are um, closed at the moment and, uh, you know, the normal sort of day-to-day -day, uh, activity we, 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 we used to is not taking place. So have you any insight into that or any ideas about um, what com companies might do to, to mitigate that risk? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly very, uh, very common, Paul, and I think I've provided a, a, a written answer on the chat as well. Um, I mean, from our perspective, we would absolutely encourage uh, businesses to report to uh, action fraud. Um, now, it might not result in a full-blown criminal uh, investigation, but what I can assure you is we absolutely use that intelligence and information to, uh, to, to act on it in a broader uh, sense. Uh, I think I touched on in my presentation, we do a, a lot of uh, website disruption, for example, where we work with internet service providers to take down uh, websites which are advertising services, many of whom are, um, as you say, um, cloning legitimate businesses. Um, so I think the principal point I would like to make is, please, please, please tell us about it. And that means that we can uh, use that information to, uh, to respond effectively. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Maya, um, one thing which you touched upon in your presentation was the um, relative continuity of um, FCPA related uh, investigations and prosecutions during the Trump administration. Um, I'm sure that everybody has seen uh, news coverage of how the incoming Biden administration is, is apparently um, front loading the Department of Justice and the SEC with uh, a new cadre of uh, litigators and investigators, uh, which probably gives some kind of indication of, of their, uh, their likely focus on these issues uh, in the next four years. Um, maybe I can sort of offer a controversial, provocative question here and um, ask your view on whether uh, the DOJ will be, um, as some people suspect or some people uh, indicate, more focused on um, non-US companies than they are on US companies. Uh, well, that is a, a tricky question. I, I think that um, if you read the recent speeches from SEC and DOJ divisional leaders, um, they are talking about uh, the need to ensure that they go back to basics and align their prosecution efforts with the tenets of their legislation, and that is um, to, to safeguard their securities law and their, um, their fair marketplaces and to really go after egregious conduct. So they are absolutely overwhelmed and swamped with complaints because of their whistleblower system and, and um, just the notoriety of, of their actions. And I think that those departments uh, have very smart people in them. And many of their pronouncements are about egregious conduct 
or those actions they are going to pursue hotly where it lessens the uh, resources of the enforcement agencies and leads to more timely, um, efficient and effective prosecutions. They don't like recidivists. Um, uh, they, they don't like grand mal fraud across jurisdictions. Um, and they certainly don't want to hear, or they get very excited if they hear about um, managerial colluding and conspiracy to hide the fraud. So that's, that's what they're saying. Um, I don't think it matters if it's an American or a foreign company. They're going to stick to their tenants. Yeah, quite. Um, I, I suppose related to that, there is a, another comment or question. Um, if the United States still has a global leadership role to play, which I think everybody would, would agree it does, do you think that um, by setting a, a sort of proactive example that we can see countries uh, on an individual basis also uh, reinforcing and reinvigorating the domestic um, anti-corruption uh, programs and legislation? Uh, you know, I think this is a really good academic question. The, 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 one of the concerns for multinational companies is that they are answerable to many masters. And so we all know that intelligence agencies are now cooperating with one another. The worst thing a company wants is to be prosecuted on multiple occasions for the same offence. Yeah. Um, however, you know, you and I both know that uh, if something happens in China and, and the US gets wind of it, it goes aggressively for uh, the, the affiliate, but so will the Chinese authorities in their own, own way. Um, and experience has demonstrated this in other countries like Indonesia, you know, the Philippines, or the Singapore, Malaysia. So, you know, the, the message is that um, you, you can't shortchange compliance resources in the international markets. You've got to be consistent on your toes. Thank you, Maya. Um, now, unfortunately, we, as always with these webinars, we, we have more questions than time. Um, but I would encourage uh, participants today um, to stay in touch uh, with us. And uh, we'd be certainly happy to pass on questions uh, that you feel you'd, you'd really like a, an expert uh, answer to. Um, I think today's webinar has been an excellent overview. And, you know, as I said, certain phrases have uh, been really sort of uh, interesting here, like a, a fraud epidemic within the pandemic, um, the tone from the top during the pandemic, and, and uh, Maya's uh, comments around the... Um, uh, you know, how we shouldn't shortchange um, or companies shouldn't shortchange compliance uh, as we emerge from the uh, from the pandemic world. Um, I think uh, in uh, final commentary, I would just say uh, a very sincere thank you to our panelists today and uh, to those who have dialed in and, and been so proactive with their questions. Um, Aperio will be hosting another webinar on the 7th of April which will be chaired by my colleague Larissa Norman, who is the uh, practice head for Middle East and uh, North Africa. And uh, switching gears entirely, she will be hosting a webinar around the end of the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council's um, boycott and embargo of Qatar, and what that means for trade and investment in the Gulf region generally. Um, as I also mentioned, this webinar will be available later as a recording and we'll be in touch with all participants uh, with a summary uh, note as well. So it remains only to say thank you uh, again to our participants, our panelists who provided an excellent overview, and uh, we hope to see you at the next uh, Imperial webinar in April. Thank you very much. <laughs>